University of Herat Umut. I am uh, Associate Professor Dr. Ilhami, your MC for today. Before we go any further, with today's webinar, we are some housekeeping announcement. Firstly, kindly mute yourself while the session is running. We welcome questions at any time of the session. Please type it in the chat area as we'll attend to it soon during the session. Secondly, the session will be recorded by EDEC and will be made available in EDEC official YouTube channel, EDEC Muslim Layer. Please do not press any recording button on your laptop during the session. Thirdly, kindly ensure that you have filled in the attendance form and feedback form before leaving the session. Please note that certificate is only provided to participants who have filled out the feedback form. Both links will be provided in the chat area towards the end of the session. And for your information, some photo session will also be conducted at the end of the session. Then kindly open your camera. So now let me introduce you to our today's speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Deborah Hall. Professor Dr. Deborah Hall is joining Herod Ward University as Malaysia's first professor of positive psychology. Professor Dr. Deborah graduated from Brunel University UK with a first class honors degree in psychology and completed a PhD in psychology from Birmingham University in 1996. In her early career, she established a world leading research program in auditory MRI funded by the Medical Research Council. She has received the Murray and Jack Shapiro Prize from the British Tetanus Association on a number of occasions. Most recently in 2020 for the publication of Quiet Trials, which compared the novel drug AUT-00063 with a placebo in a robust statistically powered multi-center random dice uh, trial. So, uh, Prof, over to you. Prof, thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for, for being here. Um, you could probably tell from that short bio, I've had quite a, a varied um, academic career as a researcher and a teacher. Um, and I'm going to draw on kind of those wide uh, ranges of experience um, in talking to you today about what we can do as teachers to enhance student well-being. Um, so you should all be able to see my title slide. Uh, if somebody could write in the chat just to confirm that you can see my slide and hear me clearly, that would be uh, very much appreciated. I'll try and monitor the chat as I go along. Thank you. Um, I do encourage you to write questions in the chat as we go along. Um, if uh, you're curious about anything uh, that I'm talking about or want to know more, uh, we've got two hours. Um, I'm hoping that I don't take the whole two hours, but um, that gives us plenty of time for interaction and for chit chat because this is an opportunity for you to, to, to learn and hopefully take something away uh, from today's um, workshop. So I was invited to talk about uh, purposeful leadership and student well-being. This is something that um, we focus on very explicitly in our teaching at uh, Harriet Watt University in Malaysia. Um, and specifically for today, we're going to think about um, what role we can play as lecturers. And I'm making the assumption that the people joining today's uh, webinar are all academic staff. Um, if you're not an academic staff, maybe you could introduce yourself to me in the chat uh, and tell me uh, what your role is. Maybe you're a student, an undergrad or a postgrad, but I'm assuming that I'm speaking to fellow academic staff today. The work that I'm going to talk about covers a wide range of areas. So in case I forget to say thanks to my collaborators, um, uh, currently my research work looking at promoting student well-being uh, and leadership skills um, involves the following staff and students. 
and a number of external collaborators, including some staff and postgraduate students at the University of Malaya. So, so I wanted just to start off um, with a little bit of background. Um, I don't know whether you, you're familiar with this um, term, but involution was one of the most commonly used Chinese words of 2020. Um, if we um, take the, the Chinese um, um, terms, it's made up of two linguistic elements that mean a process that curls inward, ensnaring individuals in what has been described as the, the sort of experience of being locked um, in competition that is ultimately meaningless. In other words, it's about um, moving towards a destination without any particular purpose in mind. Now, this term kind of came about through lots of discussion at the time on um, social media. Um, <clears throat> so let me just um, move forward on my slide. There we go. Yeah, you should be able to see uh, a picture here uh, from social media. Um, many of the young people in China um, can only see one way to be recognized and valued in society. And often that way is to get top grades at college, get a well-paid job, get married, buy an apartment. Uh, and those kind of ideals lead college students often to work really, really inhumane hours. And the epitome of that kind of lifestyle was captured on social media in September in 2020, when you can see here, uh, there was a photograph of a student from Beijing's um, elite Tsinghua University, and that he was caught on video riding his bicycle at night. Uh, and if you just look, you can see the laptop propped up on uh, the handlebars. And this picture created a flurry of social media debate and from that, another phrase was born, the double O lifestyle, which has nothing to do with James Bond. Uh, it's, a, it's meaning working online 24 hours, uh, seven days a week. Uh, and maybe some of you can <laughs> relate to that, you know, thinking about how we had to cope with the challenges of the, uh, the pandemic time when everything was moving online. So you can imagine in this kind of environment, it's no wonder that youths in China and elsewhere are becoming disillusioned with that monotony of life, you know, working 24 hours, seven days a week. What is it all for? Now, an involuted state of mind is focusing only on accomplishments like financial success, or getting um, a good quality degree or getting promoted to the next rung on the ladder. But psychology tells us that focusing only on accomplishments is not enough to sustain um, a sense of well-being. Now, there needs to be a, a feeling that there's more to life than just that. And the, so the, I want to talk a little bit now about the opposite of involution, which is well-being. Um, now, well-being talks about all of those things that make up a good life. And there, psychologists talk about accomplishments. Yes, they're important, but they're not the be-all and end-all. And there are four other components that psychologists talk about. So let me just introduce them one by one. Uh, the first is positive emotions. And they include things like um, happiness, hope, love, compassion, pride, gratitude, um, all of those things. And I'm sure you can think of others. So positive emotions are important because they can undo the harmful effects of negative emotions. 
And if we consciously try and focus on those positive emotions in our everyday life, then we can develop good habits of thinking and behaving in a positive way. Uh, the next is engagement. Um, and engagement describes that experience when you're living in the present moment and focusing just on the task at hand. So this tends to happen when you're doing something that you love, that combines some challenge um, associated with some of your best character traits. So when you're doing something that you feel you're good at, and you enjoy, and it could be anything, it could be uh, watching a really good movie curled up with your, um, your partner on the sofa. It could be going for a walk. Um, it could be going out for dinner with friends, or it could be, I don't know, reading a really good book. You know, anything that you're doing that makes the time pass really quickly that's the moment that, that you're in the flow and you're fully engaged. The next... Sorry, Prof, uh, can you show your slides in uh, presentation mode? Well, um, let me just see if I can. I don't want it to fill up the whole screen. If I do, then I'm switching between various screens and it's just a little bit difficult. So if you don't mind, I'll just show them like this. Okay. Okay. Um, positive relationships uh, is the next one. And so what did I want to say about positive relationships? Well, this refers to feeling supported, loved and valued by others, uh, you know, because human beings are social at heart and those social networks with others are really important to promote a sense of well-being and resilience. Uh, and, you know, it's not just about um, having positive relationships and celebrating when things are good, like celebrating that promotion or celebrating that degree certificate. It's also about having those relationships, those people to turn to when things are difficult and challenging. And so those positive relationships can help us overcome those difficult times. And then final, the final ingredient to a strong sense of well-being is meaning in life. And um, when we're engaged in something meaningful, it gives individuals a feeling of value and self-worth. And so having a purpose in life also helps individuals focus on what's really important. And this is particularly valuable when we're faced with significant challenges or adversity. It helps kind of guide through um, and help keep us focused on what is really important. Now, putting all of these five ingredients together gives us Seligman's theory of well-being. Um, and just to answer the question in the chat um, from Johannes, is engagement the same as flow? Um, by somebody's name who I won't try to pronounce. Yes, you're right. So engagement is the same as flow. Sorry. Um, uh, flow is when you're kind of engaged in something so, so much that the hours just fly by. And it, so it's the same psychological concept as flow. Uh, yes, uh, that's right. Well, well done. So maybe you're familiar with some of these concepts already. Um, so this is Seligman's theory of, of well-being. Um, and Seligman was, um, is a, a psychologist and um, he established the field of positive psychology um, around the, the turn of the century. Uh, and this theory was um, put forward in um, 2011 uh, in, a, in a book. So if we put those five ingredients together, don't forget about accomplishment, it spells out the word PERMA. 
And you may have heard of the PERMA model of well-being. So this is what it is. It's a sort of framework of five key ingredients that are felt to be important for well-being. Now, it's not the only model of well-being. There are other models of well-being, and they all share some kind of relationships with one another. But this one is quite compelling because you can picture each one of these five different elements. I hope as I was explaining them, you can try and relate to them on a personal level about how you try and um, kind of gain personal well-being. Um, and so when you're talking to students, when I'm talking to students about well-being, I use this model to try and provide a framework to give students an idea that, you know, well-being is something that is tangible that can be achieved. And these are the different kind of elements that you can focus on to try and achieve that sense of well-being. And if you want to know more, um, there's a, a link to a, a website where you can read more about this theoretical framework, PERMA. Now, I just wanted to say a few words about um, the meaning um, element, because there are other um, positive psychologists who have spent their whole careers focusing on the importance of meaning. And William Damon is one of those. He's director of the Stanford Center of Adolescence in the, in the US. And he wrote this book called The Path to Purpose, which is one of these kind of self-help books aimed at parents um, and also uh, teachers. But he talks about how central this sense of purpose is. You know, having an idea of where you're going in life and for that path in life to be more than just earning money or getting a good job. And he says that a majority of young people these days are really struggling to make that transition into adulthood. And we can do so much as educators to make an explicit effort to help our youth find that sense of purpose and give them a, a feeling that life has some direction. Um, and he talks about how important that is to sort of provide motivation, provide a focus for, um, for what our young people are, are doing in life. And at Harriet Watt, we've taken on board those different ideas, PERMA model of well-being, those different components, and the work by William Damon, which talks about how central a sense of purpose is to um, generate um, young people with a sense of purpose and, um, uh, and a good sense of well-being. And this is um, the, the framework that we um, have sort of created to drive our teaching programs um, at Harriet Watt University. So let me just try and kind of explain this. We're applying the principles of positive psychology uh, and practices to what we do in the educational setting. So we give students um, a range of experiential learning activities, um, and these focus on of course, we can't ignore academic excellence. That's key to everything that we do within a university establishment. But we also explicitly focus on students' resilience and well-being. Um, and we talk to students in an explicit way about these concepts. We work with students in the first year to find out a little bit more about who they are. So to discover themselves, to become a little bit more self-aware, to understand what their strengths are, um, to think about what their personal values are in life and to, um, uh, to try and think about activities that they can become involved in that give them opportunities to show their talents and to develop their talents uh, further. 
And we do this through a range of different activities, but all of our first years, for example, get involved in a community service project um, as part of their MPU course. And that's all about um, adding a positive impact to the community. It could be the student community, or it could be uh, an online community or a local community. But the key thing is it's about providing positive impact. We also um, explicitly work with our students to develop personal effectiveness. And there I'm talking about those life skills, those knowledge skills, attitudes and behaviours that are those things that employers are looking for. Communication skills, self-confidence, team working, time management, um, creativity, critical thinking, all of these skills that um, are kind of vital. Yes, employers want students with subject-specific knowledge, but they want more than that. They want holistic students who are going to be able to cope with the uncertainties of a changing world. Those are the sort of skills that employers are really looking for. And as educators within the higher education sector, it's our job to um, help develop um, those young people who will go on to become main drivers or contributors to a successful workforce. So we've got those three components around the edge, but you can see central to that, uh, we put a sense of purpose. And we really try and um, inculcate this from year one. And we talk to students ab about William Damon's work and about a sense of purpose. And we work with students um, in small groups. We coach our students to identify their own sense of purpose that comes out from um, their, their, their strengths and the things that they enjoy, that sort of defines what they would like to achieve in life. And we help students develop an action plan um, that will help them move towards that, at least within the two to three years that they're with us at university and hopefully beyond. Uh, and then if you put all of these ingredients together, then you're creating the best environment to promote a sense of flourishing, which is well-being, giving young people a chance to have a positive impact in the world, and hopefully through that to be successful. So somebody's asking uh, whether cultural or geographical differences would affect positive psychology. And that's a really interesting question because that's a, an area of debate at the moment, rich debate within the field of positive psychology. Seligman and others um, who sort of developed positive psychology um, 20 years ago took quite a Western-centric uh, view of individuals. Um, in psychology, we call it weird. It stands for Western, industrialized, educated, rich, developed nations. And that, that does introduce certain cultural biases towards one, one's view of what it is that is important to people achieving a sense of well-being. It's all about those kind of, in a Western culture, it's all about the individual. It's all about that personal sense of agency. Whereas in Asia, many countries have more of a collectivist culture. And um, in, that, in th that kind of cultural perspective, maybe the individual and individual personal gains don't play quite the, the same central role as they do in, in certainly in American culture. It's more about being part of a community, being part of um, a, a culture, or part of a society. And so what might be a sense of purpose for somebody in the West is not necessarily a sense of purpose for somebody in the East. Um, and so there are increasing debates 
about those cultural differences. Um, on Sunday, I had quite an interesting debate with um, colleagues um, from a couple of other universities, Utah and um, USM. So we had a, a webinar to celebrate um, International Day of Happiness. And we were talking about the Global Happiness Report. You might have heard about this. It's a, a yearly survey done across different countries in the world. There's over 150 countries. And the survey asks about happiness and well-being of the citizens in those countries. And up till now, most of the questions have been very Western-centric. So it's like, um, you know, how important is it to, to have money, to, um, uh, to have a good sense of, um, or, or to be healthy, to, um, and, and those kind of things. Whereas for the first time this year, they've introduced another way of measuring happiness, which is all about, do you feel a sense of balance? a sense of harmony, a sense of calmness. And this is the first time that that report has thought about the, the sort of elements of well-being that are more low arousal type elements. Before, it's all been about those high arousal things, you know, go, 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 what are you doing? What are you actively doing? That's a very kind of Western view. So... The Global Happiness Report is trying to take on board different cultural differences and has brought in these other, this other kind of measure of well-being, which is more about how do you feel a sense of balance in your life. Um, so it's a really kind of rich area for, uh, for research and I think a great opportunity for psychologists and other colleagues in Asia and Malaysia including, to think about what are those sort of unique cultural situations that might affect the way that our students and our staff understand well-being. So I hope that answered that question and do keep the questions coming. So let's just take a, a little uh, kind of segue for a moment and to lead into the next part of uh, the session just to make it a little bit more interactive we have um, a Mentimeter quiz so there's a QR code and a link um, and I'll type the link into the chat so that you can just um, click on that or you can scan the QR code uh, so there's just one quick question. So let me just switch over to Mentimeter and then I'll show the results. Great, so it's working. I can see... Um, a few people have answered. So just thinking about your own teaching practice, how much emphasis would you put on these topics? Uh, and I think you can choose two. So these are uh, some of the sections of the uh, model from our teaching at Harriet Watt. Um, and just asking you, how you um, include those in your teaching practice. So let me just, I'll stop sharing and try and switch screens so that you can just have a quick look at the results. So you should be able to see that. It may be a little bit small. I'm not quite sure how to get into full view mode. Uh, so we see that um, we've got close first and second focusing on purpose and 
personal effectiveness, those life skills, followed by academic excellence, and then well-being, and then resilience. So it sounds like maybe I'm preaching to the converted today. Um, and so I'd like to invite anybody in the audience who um, voted first for purpose or for personal effectiveness. Um, would you like to, to share how do you um, embed purpose or personal effectiveness in your own teaching practice? I don't know whether, uh, is it possible for anybody just to off uh, on their microphone just to talk? I don't know whether the people who are organizing the meeting can allow participants to on their microphone if they want to speak, or you could type in the chat. If you're a little bit shy, you can type in the chat. But the question is, just give us a quick example of how do you embed purpose or um, personal effectiveness life skills in your teaching? Hi, Deb. Hello. Hi, this is Wendy. I just would like to share my um, personal experience um, with regards to this topic. Um, so I teach a course on um, peace and humanity studies. So uh, usually during the first class, I'll ask the students, why do you sign up for this subject? So very often they will tell me, uh, well, this is the only subject that fits my timetable. <laughs> so obviously <laughs> there isn't any purpose for them to do this course, right? So, <laughs> so well, I mean, I'm glad that they are giving me a very honest answer to, you know, why they are here in my class. So, um, so what I did was I wanted them to really, you know, have this sense of purpose of doing this, this subject, though they don't really feel it at the very beginning. So what I did is, you know, I told them, you know, why peace is important, you know, uh, and how it's relevant to each and every one of us, regardless of what discipline we are from. Peace is something that humanity yearns for. So it's actually through a lot of conversation and uh, giving them a lot of real life example in class uh, to make them connect to the topic to make them connect to the subject, you know. And over the over a few classes, you know, those exercises that I do in class, eventually they do see a purpose, you know, of them uh, uh, engaging or enrolling in this particular subject. Mm -hmm. And um, and very often, I mean, not here to brag, but, but you know, I would say like almost all the time at the end of the semester, when I ask them the same question, now, do you know why are you in this class? I would say almost close to 100% you know, of them are convinced that they are in the right class and, and they feel such a great sense of purpose of doing the subject at the end of the day. So mm -hmm. I guess it's important to really um, uh, to get an honest feedback from them at the very beginning of the course, why they are in here, and then having that clear sense of purpose why are we teaching this subject I think the purpose has to come from us as a teacher why are we teaching this and why are we even passionate about this subject ourselves and and hence from that uh, sense of purpose that we embrace ourselves how do we expand that to our students you know mm -hmm. and and to allow them to to be able to appreciate this course not for the sake of completing for the sake of the two credits they are signing for and not for the sake of you know getting an A or, or to pass the exam but really what is the learning mm -hmm. objective at the end of the day you know so and and yeah so that's what I wanted to share based on my personal experience thank you so much that thank you thank you so much for sharing Mandy so I, I absolutely agree with you and this is going to be a, a, a concept that we might kind of um, pick up on later in the in today's presentation, but um, being clear about what it is that students will gain from um, the course, particularly if it's more than just simply kind of learning new new facts or new stuff, you know how it will um, help them in their in their future development um, is really important, and enabling the students to kind of be able to articulate that for themselves. Um, also, so so well done. Sounds like you do a good job. Uh, anybody else like to share before we move on to the next part of the presentation? So yeah. there, we've learned um, from one of the academic staff about how they kind of um, help students appreciate purpose, 
the purpose for uh, doing a particular course and the, the value of that course. Any, anybody got any comments about how they bring in life skills to yeah. things like communication or whatever? I do. Hmm? Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, I teach a sports psychology uh, here at the uh, Center of Sports and Exercise Sciences. So what I do, uh, as I asked you earlier, whether cultural differences has an effect. And of course, as you can see in the Western world and uh, Western culture, and as well as in here in Asia, um, uh, students here are more, they're, they're a bit shy. They're, they're, a bit, uh, they're not as open as in Western. So what, what I'll do, uh, they're afraid of, um, they're afraid of uh, uh, being at fault or you know, answering the wrong question. So what I normally do, uh, first and foremost, I say, everybody can score this, set a goal for them. Uh, this is what you're gonna get. Yeah, so like if you do this, do this, do this, and then there's no reason that you wouldn't score. So that, that gives them purpose. And, and uh, I would say that um, all it takes is effort. You know, whatever effort that you put in is, uh, I mean, will be considered. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I always uh, emphasize in the class that please speak up. There's no right or wrong question and your opinion is very valuable. So that's sort of to encourage them to be more open, to be, uh, yeah, more support and all that. That's about it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing. And I think you raise a really important point that it is important to, to recognise and appreciate effort from the students to encourage them to engage because, yeah, <laughs> even my students are, are, are also shy as well. But, you know, you learn from that interaction um, often it's about sharing your ideas and getting some immediate feedback. And so creating a safe space where students feel comfortable doing that is really important and helps boost their self-confidence. I'm sure you've noticed that as well. Great. So let's um, move on now to the next uh, part of the uh, presentation. So... I've been talking earlier about um, knowledge, skills, behaviours and attitudes. These are all things that we are um, trying to help students to develop as academic staff. Um, and in, in the rest of my presentation, I just wanted to maybe create a little bit of a space for us to kind of reflect on what we could do and what we do do in each of these four um, areas, because all of these four areas are kind of crucial to um, helping students develop that personal effectiveness, resilience, and well being. And really, my sort of take home message for today is that you know, often it's not necessarily about what you're teaching, it's more about how you're teaching. We know that from research that students enjoy a particular subject more because of the influence of a really inspirational, positive teacher than because of a, an innate kind of um, passion for a topic. So each one of us as educators has you know, a massive responsibility in our role to inspire and motivate students to learn and to enjoy learning the topic that we are trying to teach them. So um, let's just pause to reflect on that for a moment. And I have another quick Mentimeter quiz. So if you go back um, into Mentimeter, I think it's the same link. That will work, but let me just type it in the chat again and the QR code. Uh, there's just one other question which asks you to, um, invites you to rate how many, thinking about in a typical, I don't know, in a typical academic year, how many of your classes 
have each of these four elements as explicit learning outcomes. So thinking about knowledge, skills, behaviors, and attitudes, thinking about the learning outcomes. So let me just share the Mentimeter slide so that you can see. Yeah, I've got it working now. So, wow, okay. So I would have expected knowledge to be up there, and indeed it is just kind of pipped to the post. So, you know, nearly all classes are, are kind of imparting some new knowledge that's explicitly in the learning outcomes. Um, close behind, we've got skills um, and then behaviours. And um, just slightly behind that is attitudes. So I guess skills um, is also uh, an easy one to think of examples of how we would teach skills um, at a university level. In psychology, in my field, the skills that we teach our students are things like numerical reasoning skills, we teach them how to handle numbers, do statistics, design experiments, um, uh, and those sort of skills. I guess what I'm interested in today are the behaviours and the attitudes, because these are sometimes a little bit more implicit and may not always be at the forefront of students' minds when they come to university. They might not necessarily think that they're going to be developing good behaviours and, and positive attitudes. So for those of you who um, uh, scored behaviours and attitudes, um, around kind of six or seven. I'm interested in uh, you sharing your experiences of how do you include these as an explicit learning outcome and what kind of behaviours and attitudes are you trying to develop um, in your students? So uh, this is the last sort of interactive quiz. So do come forward and, and share if you have um, anything that you would like to share with us that you think uh, would be helpful for us to learn from one another. So don't be shy. And if anybody wants to on their microphone. Yeah, Shakrim from Science. Hello, hi. Hi. Yeah, basically, when we talk about behavior, I think because in science, like me, in, I'm, I'm teaching biology. So uh, somehow I feel like there is a need about to, to put, to, to, to develop uh, some sense of uh, good attitude, uh, have ma uh, good manners, good common sense among science students. So sometimes we, we are focusing on uh, basically on theory, basically on skills, but rather than the soft skill in terms of uh, how you communicate, how you uh, deal with people. I think nowadays uh, we need to have this kind of uh, input uh, embedded to our students. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I really hope that I can, I, can, I can learn something on how we can embed this kind of uh, behavior or attitude into a positive behavior, positive attitude into a science students. That's is probably this is something that I, I will learn today. Yeah, great. So do you currently talk to your biology students about um, a, a positive attitude? Or are you hoping to learn today how to do that? Yeah, no, actually, I try to. Uh, yeah, I read a few here and there. Just try to make, uh, how to say, uh, more, in, um, more, more communication, how to try to give more examples out there. Try to ref uh, I, I did a lot of reflection, kind of like when, when I, give you, uh, I give them some theories and then, uh, then try to reflect on uh, a, a real knowledge or a real situation try to do a, a, if you can apply and how you re how you react how you feel how 
emotionally you attach with that situation and how you how you as a layman think about it uh, so this is something that i try to i, I hope that can uh, give them some ways to how to say uh, develop some i i i really uh, love this word common sense yeah mm-hmm. because sometimes you you learn something and then you want to apply you don't have common sense and then it's kind of like oh because i have i know the theory so i'm right so sometimes you don't make sense of what you are telling people uh, things so i try this is something that i, I always put in my mind every time i teach how to put common sense in my students yeah the good dose of common sense takes people a long way uh, yeah thanks for sharing thank you anybody else Yeah, hi Deb. Uh, Wendy again. Um, I think mine is more on a question rather than um, um, a comment. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we know um, education is just not about passing on knowledge. It's, it's really about, you know, transforming behaviors and attitude as well, you know. And in fact, that should be one of the priority in education. Mm-hmm. But the problem or the challenge is um, we can't see a person's attitude or behavior transform overnight or over a semester or even four semesters, you know. So, so I, I think that would be the challenge uh, because it's not something that we could see immediate um, results of whatever we have done in the class. So how do, we, um, how do we know that, you know, whatever we have done in the class actually do have impact on the transformation of the behavior or the attitude of the students? How do we know that it actually works? Mm-hmm. Yeah, probably that that would be my question. Thank you. I want to add also on that because because they have pre-existing behavior or pre-existing attitude when they came to class. So I don't know how you want to change or you want to uh, lead to the the, the uh, yeah. I I echo the uh, the Wendy about this. Yeah, the, those are great. Those are great questions, and I you know I agree with you that you know it's very. It is quite challenging to, you know, change attitudes over a short time scale. And so, you know, some of the things that I'm going to pick up on that we try and do at Harriet Watt are things like um, work as a teaching team so that across different classes and across different years, the students are getting consistent messages from academic staff about what are the you know what are the right sort of attitudes or mindsets um, that we are trying to develop um, trying to you know reinforce those messages about having a positive mindset uh, that's something that I'll, I'll talk about in the next few slides um, and I don't know whether you have the same system at UM, but uh, Harriet, what we we have a, a UK teaching system where all of our undergraduate students are allocated to a personal tutor who is there to provide a little bit of pastoral support. So a personal tutor will see the student all the way through the years at university. And it's a member of academic staff with whom the student can develop a little bit more of a strong personal relationship because you've got that continuity year on year. And the role of the personal tutor is to have more of these personal development conversations with students about kind of, you know, where they see themselves heading after university, what kind of extracurricular activities are the students doing to try and develop those skill sets, those behaviours that they um kind of are hoping to kind of take forward in life. So I think when we're talking about behaviours and attitudes, then I think it's also kind of maybe important to think about how we can embed those in the in the longer term and also to have reinforcement of messages, the same messages across different courses in the teaching team. So thank you for clarifying. It looks like The public universities in in Malaysia have a similar kind of system, a mentor-mentee relationship with uh, one student and one lecturer. So I don't know how your system works. We meet with our students three times every semester, so that's six times a year. Um, And, uh, you know, any additional meetings that the student requests in between times 
Um, and we will also usually supervise the same students through their internship um, as well. And I counsel my students on thinking about doing internships and extracurricular activities that align with their sense of purpose that they sort of develop and try and articulate in year one to try and link up the students thinking about their career journey. Great, so um, thank you for, for that sharing. As I said, what um, I'm going to do in my uh, presentation is to um, kind of think about um, each one of these things uh, in turn, and we can have, a, a maybe we'll have time for a little bit further discussion. So firstly, I wanted to start off talking about attitudes because, you know, attitude might be such a little thing, but actually, I think as some of you have already commented, it can make a really big difference um, to uh, how students um, how students learn and their attitudes towards learning. Oh yes, we've got lots of quizzes today. So my next slide is just a, a little quiz to do yourself. Um, grab a piece of paper or kind of just jot down on your mobile phone. Ask yourselves these six questions and each question has a true or false answer. So please be honest with yourself. Just a little bit of self-reflection. Um, we're not going to share this back. This is just for personal self-reflection. So I'll just give you a moment to work through those six questions. Okay, so there's no right or wrong answer to this quiz. Um, it, it's aimed to just reveal to you um, the sort of mindsets that you try and um, encourage in the classroom. So before we go over the um, how you responded to the quiz, let me just um, share the next slide. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit um, uh, uh, about um, psychological research and what do we know about the importance of attitudes. Well, as I was saying, you know, a little bit of the right attitude can make such a big difference um, because the way that we think and approach our learning and teaching really determines how much benefit we gain from that. And positive psychologists talk about two different kinds of mindsets. You can think of a mindset as like an attitude. Um, there's a fixed mindset and a growth mindset, okay? Now, these are, you know, kind of ends of the spectrum. Obviously, it's a little bit more complicated than just black and white, but these are the, the two sort of endpoint mindsets um, that are kind of typical in you know in in the classroom so the fixed mindset is you know i've shown a picture of a, a glue pen because it's thinking when students and teachers think that you know qualities and attributes are sort of fixed you know that sort of mindset that thinks you know you're either born smart or born less smart and there's not much you can do to, to kind of change that, to change your intelligence. Um, whereas a growth mindset thinks that, you know, anybody can increase their intelligence and increase their, 
um, sort of achievements and performance through hard work and effort. So the growth mindset is thinking, if I really work hard at this, then I can get better. Um, so hopefully you can see that, you know, that, that distinction, quite clear distinction between those two. So with that in mind, going back to the quiz, um, this is how to, to score it. So if you just reflect back on how you responded about what kind of attitudes you try and set up in the classroom with your students, you can see that if you answered false to the odd numbered questions, then that's indicative of a growth mindset. And if you answered true to the even numbered questions, that is also indicative of a growth mindset. And the converse is a fixed mindset. So I'll just give you a moment to score the way that you responded. And then just reflect on were more of your responses a growth mindset or a fixed mindset? Now, I expect everybody's perhaps a mixture of the two but you can pat yourself on the back if most of your responses were in the growth mindset category. And if you do have any responses in the fixed mindset category, then maybe those are indications of things that you might try and change in the classroom. So happy for you to share in the chat uh, what you found. We've got um, one uh, of today's participants has already shared that they've got a growth mindset. 50-50, <laughs> yeah, that's not uncommon. So as I say, you know, often it's a, a, a mixture of the two. So if you did get a mixture, then those with a fixed mindset are perhaps, you know, Take those away and think, how can you try and shift your students more towards a growth mindset in that particular area? Yeah. So I hope, hope that helps. Just a little bit of um, self-reflection. Uh, to give you a, a little bit of, a, you know, better awareness of things that you might have already suspected, but sometimes it's helpful just to work through these little activities as a bit of a, a personal learning experience. Um, so what do other teachers do to try and inculcate um, a growth mindset? Well, one of the psychologists who's done a, a lot of work um, in this area is somebody called um, Carol Dweck. She's um, a, a teacher, an educational psychologist who works in the US. Um, there's some quite inspirational um, talks that she's given. You can find them on, on YouTube where she talks about um, student learning. Um, she talks about um, one case study, which is um, a school in um, Chicago in the US. And that school has been quite um, bold, I would say. And they've changed the way that they grade students. So instead of your typical pass fail, um, this school um, gives a grade of pass or not yet. So they don't have fail, they just have pass and not yet. So students get the score of not yet. If they haven't passed all the necessary courses, they need to graduate. So what difference does that make? Well, you can hopefully imagine that the difference between getting a fail versus a not yet, the not yet label gives students a, a kind of way of thinking about a path into their future and it makes them think that they're on some sort of learning curve rather than maybe a dead end 
that a fail label gives. And it's quite a powerful pos philosophy of positivity. Um, it feels a lot less final. It makes students think that change is possible. Now, rather than saying, no, you failed, it's more like a, mm, not quite yet, just kind of keep trying. And through her research, she's shown that um, students in, in this school do um, try harder um, to, um, to improve their scores. So students with a not yet um, are, um, are, are, there's evidence that they're, they're trying harder, which is, is great to see. Um, what we do at um, Harriet Watt, particularly in the first year, we have these coaching sessions where we talk to students about kind of where they want to go in life and we help them create an action plan of um, how to get there. Uh, and this is a quote from, from one of our students who's gone through that program. Um, and so I'll... Just let you read that. So this, I think it's quite a nice illustration of a student in which we've sort of successfully fostered that growth mindset. The student kind of has helped, helped them to find their potential or to unleash their potential. So hopefully the student will make the most of opportunities at university to achieve that potential that they've seen in themselves. So what can we take away from this? What role can we play? Well, we've talked about fostering a growth mindset. So, you know, I've heard stories already about you being encouraging and motivating. And yes, it's about doing more of that. It's about maybe recognizing where in the classroom you might have some fixed mindset blockers and to try and do something to turn those around um, in the classes that, that you um, have. Um, another simple tactic that I'm just sharing is now, in your assessment feedback, it's very easy to just be negative, but what we try and do is give a balance. So we, in our feedback, we tell the students two things that they've done well, and then we also say, you know, it's not two things that you've not done well, it's two things that you could improve on for a better mark. So that's what we're very explicit in telling our students, so that hopefully that helps to foster more of a, a growth mindset. Um, so I'll just pause there, um, stop sharing. And is there, is there anything that anybody else wanted to add from their own personal teaching experience about how they try and foster a positive mindset, a growth mindset? Any other tactics to share with the rest of the group? Um, hello, Deb. Diana here from the Arts and Social Sciences. Hi, Diana. Um, rather than sharing tactics, I think something that I learned, um, I did my undergrad and master's in Malaysia and I was teaching in Malaysia. I went to the UK for my PhD and experienced something a bit different mm -hmm. in what you were saying. Um, two positive things and two limitations of studies, for instance. Now, coming back here, I noticed a pattern that we're giving feedbacks to especially research students after they're presenting the proposal or their um, research. There is a tendency to be overly critical. And I, I believe it has a lot to do with culture, whereby in um, many Southeast Asian culture, uh, the, being critical is considered helpful. Mm. Okay, especially when you're very uh, you're exceptionally blunt about it, it's considered um um build it builds character. Um, it, of course, it was very different because in uh in the UK is it tends to be a bit more um 
it you know it, it's it's not as blunt as it is here, uh, and I think that that's how it's it's nurtured. So coming back, it's I, I would still use the approach I've learned um, by being very encouraging towards students. Even say their research methodology is a bit ambitious, so there's a way of telling them they're being ambitious without making them feel bad for not being able to proceed with that particular design that they have in mind. Um, and uh, I would say that being consistent and um, being more wary of their uh, circumstances, especially um, postgraduate students when they're working, they tend to have less time to think about um, their studies, um, their, their balancing here and there 50-50, yeah. and even uh, undergraduate students, they are mostly not well versed in research. So you, there, there is a need to walk them through things. But uh, what I like to highlight here is this cultural uh, stigma that if you're helping students too much, you're coddling them. And when coddling, you're not critical, you're not helping them. So I'm not sure how the others feel about it, but that's my observation. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That, that's a really interesting uh, feedback. And you know, thanks for sharing your personal experience uh, about that. Does, does anybody else in the in the call today have a, a comment or a reflection on that or wants to add something new? Hi, this is Vinod. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm from Faculty of Medicine uh, and uh, I teach professionalism in medical education. And uh, most of the time when we are actually trying to do that, we get students to do reflection and reflecting practice. Uh, the most important approach towards that was always uh, try to discuss professional dilemmas at workplace, and then based on that, uh, we try to get the students to reflect. And uh, one of the one of the principles which I have been following basically is uh, what we call as appreciating inquiry. Most mm -hmm. of you might be quite well aware of that. And uh, as uh, Diana was mentioning, uh, the the the, what what I believe basically is like uh, I'm sorry to say if I'm uh, if I'm going against the line I don't think we are the source of truth and I do believe that the students they themselves can find the source of truth so when I'm giving feedback I ask them what did you do well and what could you do better so they will come up with most of the things so trying to uh, yeah uh, and 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 both for my undergraduate classes as well as postgraduate classes, I have seen uh, positive changes, but uh, the sustainability of change, those changes will depend on their environment. Yeah, thank, thanks for sharing. So, um, interesting comment about asking students to uh, evaluate themselves. You know, often we maybe don't give students the space to develop those self-evaluation and self-monitoring skills. And it can be a really useful exercise to ask students, if you can do this in a classroom setting, it's a bit more difficult to, to do it when you have to give written feedback, but when you're face-to-face -face in the classroom, whether it's virtual or um, on campus, asking students to reflect on their own performance is a, is a really good way to kick off that conversation in a, a non kind of critical, non-negative sort of way. And thank you for commenting on using kind of techniques of appreciative inquiry. So for those of you who've not come across that term before, it's a, it's a tactic or a skill that is used a lot in coaching um, and student counselling. An appreciative inquiry is about being non-judgmental and just being openly curious to know more. And kind of so as the first speaker was just saying, you can you can raise a critical point, but think about the, the words that you use, the language that you use. You can turn it from being quite harsh and negative into something kind of softer and more kind of encouraging students to grow. Um, so, you know, rather than saying, I don't think this was a good idea, is that, you know, maybe you can think about this alternative 
there are kind of different ways of, of phrasing it. And so appreciative inquiry is one of the tactics that, that you can use to kind of turn negative comments into more of a question to explore a little bit more, to ask the students if they've thought about alternative hypotheses or alternative ways of doing things. So all of the what, what tactics, what they have in common is that it's all about encouraging students to develop good behaviours in kind of self-evaluation um, and encouraging students to think about how they could have done things differently to get a better mark. Um, so using those kind of approaches in the classroom are all, are all different effective ways of trying to foster uh, that growth mindset. So thanks for, for sharing. Uh, on to the next, um, uh, the next part of the presentation. So let me just... So let's just uh, move on now to think about behaviours. So I think this was the uh, this was the third um, sort of outcome, learning outcome in the little quiz, interactive quiz um, that we that we did. So what are, what kind of um, behaviours do we want to? Um, help develop? Well, let me just kind of take a, a little segue um, and give you a, a little bit of kind of psychological um, sort of background. Um, so I think I've mentioned, I have mentioned already the Global Happiness Report. And in this report, one there are two um, measures of uh, well-being. One is asking about positive feelings. So, you know, over the last day, um, how much did you feel kind of happy, satisfied with life, those kind of questions. And negative feelings, you know, over the last day, how much time have you kind of worried, been afraid, been upset? And what we, what the survey has found is that there are three factors that really boost those positive feelings. And I've shown them in bold on the slide. So they're things like social support, freedom to make choices in life, and generosity, which is around giving to others and charitable donations. People who engage in all of those three things, who have a good support network, live in a, a country where they've got freedom to make personal choices and undertake kind of personal giving tend to be the people who have a greater level of overall well-being and life satisfaction. Negative feelings can be reduced also by three factors, but they're slightly different. So we've got social support, freedom to make life choices, the same, but also perceptions of corruption, either within business or within government. Now, the report has also shown that well-being is mo more substantially contributed to having more of the positive feelings. So positive feelings contribute the most to our overall level of well-being. And the negative feelings do play a role, but a, a lesser role. So if we want to have a, achieve a greater sense of well-being in life, then it's about boosting those positive feelings. That can make the biggest difference. And, you know, it's, it's difficult as teachers to influence some of these things because they're more uh, societal or they're outside the classroom. But I just wanted to share with you some of um, our kind of um, our approaches to engaging the students um, to become uh, a little bit more uh, generous. So let, let me just, I mean, return back to the MPU course um, that we run with all of our first year students, which is part of our Empower program that runs across all of the three or four years at university. So MPU in year one is compulsory for all of our students. 
This is the course where we teach our students to uh, discover their purpose and think about how they can be intentional and purposeful in their actions or their behaviours towards one step towards achieving that purpose. And we give the students in semester two a chance to put those ideas and commitments into action through community service projects. And here's just one example of uh, a really kind of quite innovative project that our students last year ran while we were in lockdown. Uh, and this was a group of students from mathematics and actuarial science who wanted to give a helping hand to students who were struggling with mathematics, who were taking SPM and IGCSE courses or exams. And through a range of um, webinars that the students organised, there was no intervention from staff, but all this was fully student-led. So they um, uh, ran these uh, courses um, and they provided teaching uh, input to students who signed up um, to these courses. And they did a, re a really great job. The feedback was really uh, very positive. In fact, some students said um, that um, you know the lecturers were amazing, some of the concepts they didn't understand, but they now understood because the topics were clearly explained. And each of the courses that they offered attracted up to 60 students. So this, they went through a network of high school teachers uh, to reach out to, to those students in need. So they provided some supplementary teaching. The students gave really positive feedback, so that boosted the self-confidence of our students. Uh, and our students also kind of got positive benefits through their positive behaviours because they, you know, they got a chance to develop their teaching skills um, and they also felt that they got a sense of giving back to the community. So thinking about opportunities for students to do extracurricular activities that involve being generous to others um, can boost students' learning. I also wanted to share with you a few uh, learnings from social psychology. So here there's uh, some research that was done uh, a number of years ago now, but looking at the power of role models. Uh, in this study, I think they used psychology students and they presented different scenarios, one with a successful role model and another scenario with uh, a, a graduate who was uh, unsuccessful in securing a job um, after university. Um, and they asked students after reflecting on those scenarios how inspired they were personally to work hard to do well in life. And you can see that the students who'd experienced the successful role model scenario, that's the blue column, they showed more inspiration than the students in the, in the orange column who'd experienced the, uh, the, the unsuccessful role model. So this finding and many other studies show that, you know, helping students see different role models helps those students feel more inspired because they've got somebody who's successful in life to compare themselves with. Uh, those role models can encourage students to do better in life. And they can also kind of give students a, a path to achieving greatness through their own personal development. And the research has shown that, you know, it's not just about inspiration. It does translate into those students engaging in more proactive behaviours to develop themselves in a positive direction. So how can we do this as academic staff? Well, you know, if you're teaching in psychology, then maybe it's fairly easy to build into some of your classes or your tutorials, encouraging students to think about positive role models. And in my social psychology classes, we've been doing a bit of that uh, this year. 
But there are other ways to, to do it. And, you know, as academic staff, we can all take opportunities to create extracurricular opportunities. And one of the things that I've been doing at Harriet Watt this year is to have informal evening with conversations with some of the senior leaders linked to our university. And we've called it an evening with series. So Datuk Yasmin, um, who is um, a leader in IT across Malaysia, um, she's been head of Hewlett Packard and Dell, and now she's working as an um, executive, non-executive role in various companies and advising government. She's the chair of our board of directors. We had a great conversation with her on uh, International Women's Day. And those conversations were emceed by two of our students. Um, so it gave our students a great opportunity to develop their skills, but she's a fantastic role model. And she was talking to the students about her career, about some of the challenges that she faced in her career, particularly as a woman in IT. And the students got a chance to interact with uh, Data Yasmin and ask her questions. And she was extremely candid and honest about the, you know, the challenges of being successful in Malaysia, being a woman in Malaysia, working for multinational companies, etc. And so we plan to continue this series. And I just show on this slide the speakers that we've got lined up uh, this year. And these are a forum for anybody. So if you were interested in some of these speakers and wanted to know more, wanted to, to share this opportunity with any of your students, then do email me for more details because um, uh, they're free, they're open to all, and uh, we'd be happy to engage students from other universities in those informal conversations. So that's just one thing that I've been doing personally to introduce positive role models to our students. Uh, and I'm sure that amongst you, you may have um, other ideas of your own. Here's a comment from a student um, who um, realizes that, um, you know, we want to be like good people and they want to help others. So this is a student who's recognized the power of generosity um, and will work hard to try and take on those behaviors. So what role can lecturers play? Well, I've put up a number of ideas here on how you personally can be a positive role model to your students. I mean, don't forget that you yourself are a, a role model and many students actively talk about being inspired by um, academic staff. So I'll just leave that list up for a reflection a moment, but happy to open the floor to anybody who wants to um, share on um, what they do to to help students identify with a positive role model, either themselves or um, encourage students to think about posit a po positive role model uh, external to them. So any comments on how to inculcate positive behaviors? Invite anybody just to turn on my microphone. Uh, hi, hi, Deb. Hi. Yeah. Um, I think I I have a question. Can I ask a question instead of giving like a comment? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I I agree that as a lecturer, it's important that we become the role model of our students because um, a lot of times students, they observe. <laughs> observation is very important and mm -hmm. they learn more from their observation a lot of times. 
So, um, and, and definitely it's going to be very helpful if we can be a role model, especially when we're having physical classes where students get to see us, where students get to interact with us. Mm-hmm. But how do we play a, uh, this, this positive role model, this role as a role model in a um, virtual um, platform? Like, you know, classes are conducted online. We don't really get to see the students. We don't really get to interact with them like physically. So how do we able to play this positive role model on a virtual learning environment? Yeah. So I think it's, you know, it's even more important for our students, isn't it, to try and be a positive role model while we are learning virtually because our students are so vulnerable, I think, and they're learning often alone and independently and it's difficult to stay motivated under those circumstances. So, you know, one of the, some of the things that I've been doing with my students is that um, um, so I'm just I'm just looking at the bullet points to see if there's anything that I can highlight with an example. So I always try to teach in ways that engage students and inspire learning. So I've tried really, really hard in online teaching to engage with the students. We had a comment earlier from somebody saying, you know, students tend to be shy. They don't like to turn on their cameras. They don't like to talk quite so much. They find that a little bit intimidating. So how else can we engage our students? We can kind of design online quizzes, like the Mentimeter type things that we've been using today. In our online system, we've got uh, a whiteboard and students can type uh, and those typewritten comments come up on on a screen and they're completely anonymous. So the students can suggest something without it being linked back to them. So they feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, And I try and inspire learning by um, engaging. So I've moved towards more of a flipped classroom teaching where that my lectures are recorded and then the the classes are more space for discussion time. And I try and share with my students my passion for the subject and draw on kind of anecdotal comments about my own experiences, you know, related to the topic. So that's how I've been doing it personally in the online environment. And I suppose I would say I've probably gone a little bit, you know, like 110%, a little bit beyond uh, what I would normally do in the feedback that I've given to students. So, you know, thinking about those two things you've not done well and two, uh, two things that you could improve on, I've made sure that I've been quite expansive in my comments to students on how they could improve to try and be a positive role model to show students that I'm really passionate and caring about their own personal development and that I'll sort of go the extra mile to to help them do well and to help them learn better. So there's there's no easy answer to that. I think it's just kind of, you know, think about your own personal style as a teacher and to think about how you can be as positive and encouraging as you can. Any other questions or comments? Hi yeah. there. Hi. Hi. I'm Kiran here. Hi, Kiran. We'd just like to share a little bit on that also. I think um, sharing passion for the subject, yeah, that's one thing that I do with my class. Uh, I'm teaching students, master students, so I have a small class. So uh, what is important, I think, in the online environment, uh, firstly was time management. I think that is something that I have to show my students that if the class starts at 6 p.m. and then I'm there earlier than them and I see that after the first lecture, second lecture, now the students are sort of, they are there too early, as early as I am. Uh, So I can see that change in them. And as for, yeah, the camera, when we on our camera for class, um, I put I on my camera, whether I am at the office or home, I on my camera and I don't make it compulsory for them. But what I do notice is over time, after a few classes, they tend to on their cameras also. (laughs) Because then it, uh, yeah, the interaction becomes more personal. And I think then they enjoy that when they are actually looking at their classmates 
Um, but I'm not sure if it will work for undergraduate students. Postgraduate are a little bit more easier to handle in this manner. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a, a, a good comment, Kira. Then, now, from my experience teaching undergraduates, yes, they are a little bit more reticent than postgrads in turning their cameras on. But when I have smaller classes, tutorials, for example, after a few classes, my students also tend to be a little bit more comfortable. So they might not on their camera the whole time, but if they're talking, then they will on their camera. And we try and just have a space to, on the camera at the start just to say hello to each other before the class starts. And that's quite a nice um, sociable thing to do. But it's also modelling those positive behaviours, I think, you know, showing that you, you care about the students' well-being as well as their learning. Yeah. So thank you for, for sharing that. Yes. Maybe I can share one more thing that I okay. do. Uh, yeah. In, uh, yeah, because usually when we talk about assessment, uh, we talk about giving positive assessment to the students. Uh, but what I practice with my students is also their reflection on my teaching. Mm -hmm. So uh, every assessment that I give them, any assignment that is given, uh, once they have handed in the assignment, uh, I do get feedback from them on um, what they think of the assignment that was given and how it was conducted. Or mm -hmm. if we have a special activity for that week uh, and then I have a little feedback within the system itself, I put in a little feedback asking their feedback on what they think about the activity and should I continue with such activity. So that really helps me uh, improve my teaching. Yeah. That, that's a, a, a great tip. Thank you for sharing that. So let's um, move on now. I'm just conscious that it's 11.30 already, but that's fine. It, it's more important that we, we have time to, to sh share conversations with one another. Um, so um, the next topic that I just wanted to talk about, and I'll talk about this briefly because um, uh, all of us um, impart knowledge in um, our lectures to help students flourish. How can we kind of do that really effectively? Well, subject specific knowledge, let's just put that to one side because that's kind of a given. Um, but what about kind of more general sort of knowledge that's gonna be transferable? And it's worth just reminding ourselves that you know, we live in a really uncertain world. And that is not going to change just because we are coming out of uh, the pandemic phase of, of COVID. Um, here's some data from uh, LinkedIn, which is a, a, a sort of uh, job networking, professional networking uh, platform on social media. And over the uh, analyzing data over the last um, 20 years, has shown that there's an increase in job switching uh, amongst graduates. So, you know, I'm a Gen Xer and out of my kind of generation, um, people tend to, to switch jobs maybe about twice in their first 10 years out of university. Whereas for millennials now, they tend to be switching jobs about twice as often, four times. And you know, that's not going to change, I don't think, um, in the future. The, the job market is much more dynamic. There are new jobs being, new careers being invented all the time. And that creates new opportunities for students. So it's inculcating students with that knowledge where they feel comfortable in dealing with uncertainty and dealing with change, I think, can help prepare our students uh, for the future. And so one thing I just wanted to talk about was metacognition. And so just to keep you all engaged and interested, uh, a little quiz, uh, a multiple choice question. Do you know the de what de metacognition is about? So um, you can type in the chat or you can just kind of reflect uh, on what you think the answer is. Uh, hang on, I've lost my chat function. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I just got it back. So we've got a couple of people responded B. Um, uh, yeah, most people have responded B. And so if you did, pat yourself on the back because uh, that is the correct definition of uh, metacognition. It includes problem solving, but it's more than that. It's basically um, thinking about thinking. So helping students to understand what is their kind of thinking process. And why is this kind of relevant? Well, <clears throat> here's, the, here's a, a, a little diagram of what that metacognitive process uh, looks like. And um, so learners are constructing knowledge using cognitive strategies. And those strategies guide, regulate, and evaluate the learning using uh, these metacognitive strategies. So if we can help our students think about thinking, then that's actually when real learners learning occurs and our students become more skilled at using these metacognitive strategies. And then through that, they become more confident and they also become more independent as learners. You know? And being successful in life is also about being a lifelong learner. And you know, learning to cope with that uncertainty, learning new skills that are required in the new age. So if we can encourage our students to practice metacognition, then that act of thinking about their thinking can help them make a greater sense of their life experiences and it can start to um, help them achieve more through their um, academic studies. So let's just reflect on how we might be able to do that as teachers. So um, again, I'm going to kind of refer back to our year one course, because I think it's important to try and do this, you know, from the get go, as soon as our students join our university. Um, and here's one of our courses. Um, and you can see the learning outcomes and highlighted. I've um, uh, flagged emotional intelligence self-awareness and self-management. So we try and explicitly uh, teach our students some of these skills and we explicitly talk to our students uh, about some of these skills to enable them to develop some self-discovery um, and hopefully to kind of inculcate some metacognitive skills. Here you can see a quote from a student that just kind of illustrates how that student has been encouraged to think about themselves as a person and to think about how those personality traits might reflect on how they learn and how they behave and how they act in life. So it's giving students a space for some explicit reflection about metacognition. Now, what role can we play in all of this. Um, here are just three suggestions uh, for you to kind of reflect on. Um, the first one um, is about um, giving students opportunities to practice, recognizing what they don't understand. We talked about this a little bit already. For example, you know, asking students to self-evaluate, um, asking students at the end of a class, you know, what did you find most confusing about the material that we've covered today? Encouraging students regularly to reflect is encouraging that metacognitive process. Providing opportunities to reflect on coursework um, so, you know, encouraging them to think maybe before the class, I thought X, but now as a result of having gone through the course, I've learned and I now know Y. Now, how has your learning changed as a result of doing this course? That's the second tip. And the third one is, so using a wrapper to increase students' monitoring skills. 
A wrapper is a short kind of intervention that wraps around or surrounds an existing activity and it integrates a metacognitive practice. So, for example, um, after the lecture, you might ask students to write down three ideas from the lecturer, or sorry, from the lecture. Um, and then you might um, ask students to um, self-check how those three ideas match your intended learning outcomes from the lecture so that you can then just help the students evaluate how their own personal learning has matched what you were intending to teach the students um, during the course. So those are just a few of my ideas about how we can uh, more consciously embed those processes of metacognition in our teaching and give students an opportunity to practice metacognitive thinking. Does anybody have anything else that they would like to share at this point about how they embed metacognition in their own teaching practice? We've got time for one sharing, if anybody would like to Hi, comment. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm not sure whether the approach to Eddie is made the cognition or not, but uh, usually in the class, after I've introduced uh, a concept or a theory or whatever, and then I'll ask them, like, okay, how are we doing so far? Mm -hmm. And they'll give that blank um, stare at you, like, okay, that means they don't understand. So I said, I, instead of asking them, what is it that you don't understand? I'll ask them, okay, which part do you understand? And they say, okay. So then from then on, I know that they're stuck there and I'll just uh, continue. And once they're okay, and then I'll ask them to give their example. So meaning like if, if they allow, I mean, if they're able to give an example, that means they have uh, somehow uh, mm -hmm. get that concept, you know, and then I moved on. Uh, so I don't know whether that's me the cognition or not. It, it it sounds to me a little bit more like testing their understanding. Okay. Um, the metacognition kind of goes one step further and is, is asking them to think about their own thinking. So, you know, in that example, you're, you're, under, you're evaluating whether they've understood, but, you know, is that, how does that align with what you were intending to teach them? That might be an extra step that you could build in that would make it a little bit more metacognitive, but, it, it, you know, you are right that it, it's great to get those students to kind of reflect and think about illustrative examples that show that they've understood the concepts that you want to teach. Thank you. Uh, just another one. Um, I'm mm -hmm. just, uh, this is just kind of clarification from you. Uh, just that we, we've come, uh, you know, we know the terms of uh, quality of life, well being, and happiness. Uh, um, is there any distinct differences between uh, these three concepts, or is it has been used interchangeably? They're very closely interrelated, um, but um, we well-being is more about um, kind of the psychological aspects of how you're feeling. Quality of life is a little bit broader than that, so it also encapsulates. Um, sort of your financial situation um, and your health, whereas uh, well-being is is more a sort of psychological sense of, of feeling satisfied in life. But they they're sometimes used interchangeably because they do mean very similar things. I know because the thing is that I came across um, a works article that looking at physical well-being, financial well-being, and then there's quality of life. They're looking at UPT yeah. and, you know, and all these. So uh, just wondering whether, you know, it's synonym or uh, whether it's okay to use uh, this when you describe a situation or something like that. Yeah, yeah. As I say, they're, they're often used interchangeably. So as long as you're clear in explaining the how you're kind of interpreting that term, then, then, then that's fine. I tend to use well-being when I'm just talking about that kind of, as I say, that psychological sense of how are you feeling, what are your kind of emotions and what are you thinking, um, whereas I use quality of life if I'm also referring to external factors in our environment that can influence 
um, our sense of well-being. So I hope that kind of clarifies yeah. <laughs> those terms. It's sometimes a, a little bit confusing. Thank you. Um, so I'm just coming towards the, the end of my presentation, but there was one final um, uh, sort of um, aspect or ingredient to talk about, which is skills. Uh, so what role can we play to encourage our students to flourish by developing their skills? And again, just returning back to this year one course as an example of what we do at Harriet Watt, you can see that in addition to developing emotional intelligence and thinking about thinking, we also try and develop some of these transferable skills, uh, communication, leadership, teamwork, et cetera. And we did a little bit of a research uh, project to evaluate how well our teaching through our curriculum design and the way that our staff were teaching the course, how, did, how successful was that in um, improving students' perception of self-efficacy in having achieved some of those life skills. And I'm not going to go into the, the actual de technical details of the study. This is just a summary of the results showing the model that we, um, uh, we tested using the da questionnaire data that we collected. So we had 350 uh, first-year students who'd gone through the program. And at the end of the program, we asked them a, a series of questionnaires um, and um, uh, we found that um, the design of the curriculum in this program contributed really strongly to how well the students felt that they'd effectively developed some life skills. About 50% of the variance in life skills could be explained by the curriculum design and the coaching style, but it was primarily the curriculum design. So you can um, kind of, you know, through the design, you can really make a difference in how students develop these transferable skills. In this study, we also then went on to look at whether it had influenced happiness and life satisfaction. It did, but there was, while there was statistically significant, the size of the effects was quite weak. And the way that we interpret that finding is by saying that, well, maybe... Um, students need a little bit longer for those perceived life skills to have an influence on their um, subjective happiness and their satisfaction in life. Um, over the short term of the course, you don't always notice these effects. And I think we, we've already touched on that point in our uh, earlier discussions. That's what we do in year one at Harriet Watt, but what about the rest of the years two and three in our undergraduate program? Well, I've mentioned Empower already and just a few words about that. So we try and focus on a number of transferable skills and these are shown in the little infographics across the top. Our year one course focuses on leading self. So it's all about self-discovery and self-awareness, developing those meta cognitive skills, starting to um, be able to articulate a sense of purpose and taking purposeful actions towards that. In our second and third year, students can optionally undertake additional extracurricular activities. And if they fit into each, any of those six pillars, then they can get empower points in recognition of those skills that they've developed. And if they gather enough points, I think it's, if they gather a thousand points, then they'll get a certificate um, at a particular level. So leading teams, they get a kilowatt certificate. If they've developed skills at the leading communities level doing outreach work, then they get a megawatt uh, certificate. Um, and so that's the way that we incentivize and support students to develop skills while being sufficiently flexible that students can develop those skills through a lot of experiential learning activities that they can craft themselves. Here's just one really uh, recent, but I think really nice example of a second year mechanical engineering student 
He volunteered to be an MC for our Global Happiness Forum that took part on the 19th of March, a couple of weeks ago. Um, he was interviewing, he, actually he interviewed Harith Iskandar and um, Sophie Scott, I think two of our speakers. And you can see that the team of staff that were supporting the, the event. But overly while I've been chatting, you've just been reading his comments that he put on his LinkedIn page. Um, so he, he's, you know, he's reflected on how this opportunity has helped him discover his purpose and impact, but also improved his skills um, in public speaking and emceeing. And he's been kind of really grateful for that. So just one nice example of an extracurricular activity that has enabled one of our students to um, develop their self-confidence and their skills, transferable skills. And, you know, this is something they can put on their CV that will stand out to an employer, hopefully. Another quote from a student about how they develop team working skills. I think this was during one of the community projects. So through teamwork failing and then finding a solution amongst themselves, they, they um, had a great learning experience. So what role can we play as lecturers? Here are a couple of examples. Um, think about giving students real world scenarios and then asking them to, to kind of role play how they would find solutions or how they would deal with those scenarios. The examples that I've given are just all around giving students opportunities to put those skills into practice um, to build their self-efficacy. So I'm just conscious of time. Um, I won't open up for discussion. We'll just have a quick Q&A at the end. But I just wanted to follow with this, what I think kind of is a tweet that summarizes the essence of what I've been trying to, to say today. Our job as teachers is not to prepare our students for some things, some profession. Our job is really to help our students learn to prepare themselves for anything. And I'd like to thank you for uh, this invitation to present to um, ADEC and UM and thank you all for your kind attention uh, this morning. And I'll stop sharing. And we've had lots of questions and discussion as we go along. I see there's the attendance form and the feedback form in the chat. I'd be very interested to get your feedback on how you found today. Um, so I'll stop here and say thank you. Um, and any final burning questions? If not, I'll hand back to today's MC. Thank you so much, Rob for sharing, okay. Uh, are there any final questions from the audience? Uh, is there anybody who would like to share anything? Your experience in teaching on uh, well-being? All right, okay. So I think, okay, we're now reaching at the end of the session. So I would like to thank everybody for your participation. And uh, uh, can you please open your camera for photo session?